Welcome to the Human Performance Outliers podcast with hosts Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. At Human Performance Outliers podcast, we dive into a wide range of topics revolving around health, nutrition, and physical fitness. If you enjoy our podcast, please consider visiting our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash HPO podcast. Please also consider subscribing to us on your favorite podcast listening platform. Now, on to our next topic. Afternoon or something, right? It's, yeah, it's 3.08, so. Okay, perfect. Good afternoon, perfect. but good morning to you guys. Yeah, I guess I shouldn't have said good morning on that message then. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice and early for you guys. You're both early risers. Hey, for the most part, yeah. Yeah, I usually I usually get about five. So I mean, this is this is not. I mean, I, I wake up then. I usually kind of lounge in bed till about six, but this this is fine. Awesome, Zach. You want to get started here and start yeah. recording? Yeah, we can get rolling. All right. So Vanessa, you are in. You're in the Czech Republic, is that right? You're in Prague. Yeah, I'm in Prague right now. We've been here for a little while now, but we're pretty nomadic. Uh, I've been nomadic the last few years, um, and I'm originally Canadian from Vancouver, BC. That's where I went to university, and I grew up overseas. I grew up mostly in China, actually. Oh wow. Uh, so people don't know that I grew up in Beijing and ended up here. Um, and we travel quite a bit. So we'll be going to Denver in about two weeks for the holidays. So we get to be. Okay, nice. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so Pro Prague, I've been there. I've been to Prague once. Very proud. I remember the Charles Bridge was kind of a neat place to, to kind of cruise around all the artists out there and stuff. That was a, it's a real pretty city. Yeah. What, um, so let me just start with you know you 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 go by the moniker ketogenic girl so obviously and i see your keto essentials i guess that's it is that your book behind you and so uh <laughs> you know so obviously you've been a proponent and involved in in the in, in the sort of ketogenic diet world for for quite some time now and and fairly influential uh as you've got a fairly large following on social media and so and i know you had a podcast i was on there a while back and i enjoyed doing that but I know you said that you recently were looking into something called glucagon, which is a you know a hormone that antagonizes insulin and has a lot of other effects, and you wanted to discuss some of that. And so, give us a little bit of your more of your background about how you got involved in in in, in the space you're in right now, and then we can kind of go into, you know, getting into these specific issues if you want. Yeah, I would love to. So I've been running Ketogenic Girl for about four years now. I started doing a ketogenic diet in 2014. And I found it because I had uh, major inflammation issues from eating gluten. And uh, that's kind of how I started finding out. A lot of people find it through going gluten-free. But I was really into this book called The Warrior Diet by Oreo Hoffelmaker. And I was really, I've always been really big into stoicism. And he has this like warrior mindset and, you know, with the fasting and uh, I really liked his approach, but he kind of didn't really do anything low carb or keto. And it was like, he was doing OMAD, eating one meal a day, which is very similar to how the Romans ate and, and some sort of, he had a lot of historical ties, you know, that he, he founded his research on, but his diet was like anything. And a lot of times it was high carb. Um, and so it was kind of digging it, trying different things and combining low carb and keto with the OMAD that I was like, wow, I started seeing really incredible results. And my passion for it started growing. I started just posting and sharing the stuff that I was doing, what I was finding was working for me, different strategies, different biohacking things. And uh, people started to follow on the journey. And and now I am studying, I've gone back to school, I'm studying biochemistry at U of T and my research project that I'm doing right now that I've decided on is studying keto as a metabolic state and not so much a diet and that there's multiple routes to getting into ketosis. And my research project that I'm doing is on ketosis as a metabolic state as something that we can achieve with various different protocols. And the one that I'm particularly interested in is doing it with high protein. And that's what I've been doing some trials and testing and sharing. And I just went to Mallorca a couple weeks ago at Low Carb Universe and I was presenting some of this research on glucagon. And 
what happens in the body, I found this very interesting mechanism that happens in the body and it's not really being discussed when it comes to high protein and gluconeogenesis and all this stuff and glucagon. So that's one of the reasons um, I'm studying this and finding it really fascinating and wanted to talk about it with you guys. Where is, what is U of T is which, which, which uh, university? Uh, university of Toronto. So university of Toronto. Okay. Cause I went to the university of Texas and I was trying to figure oh. out <laughs> where the T was from. Yeah. We had, you know, a while back we had a guy, uh, professor Ben Bickman on and he touches on glucagon. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if you're familiar with his work. In fact, he's going to come yes. back on the show probably next month, I think. And so some really interesting stuff there. Yeah. It's something that we, we, we sort of, you know, it's a hormone like any other hormone it has a role, it has a huge role in the body. And we, we really have not, uh, uh, there's just not a lot of information out there yet. I'm sure it's coming and, and it's harder to measure obviously. And so it's not something most people are particularly facile with because it's just, you know, a new thing. It's not, a, it's not, it's a new thing we know about. It's not new, but it's, we don't really talk much about it. Let me ask you, um, uh, high protein. Uh, I, I know you experiment for a little bit with a carnivorous diet and, and, you know, obviously that's much more protein that would be traditionally considered safe or, or, or ideal on, on a more ketogenic style diet, which often tends to be, you know, moderate at best and, and sometimes even on a lower protein side. And so let me, what was your experience with that? And, and then let's get into some of the details on this glucagon and how the protein picture works. Yeah. So when I started doing this, I started posting, I did a high protein experiment, a between two to one and three to one protein to fat ratio. And I wanted to see can I stay in ketosis? Can I get in ketosis, stay in ketosis with this protocol? So I did it for just over two weeks. I tracked everything. I posted my meals. I posted how I was doing it. I was just doing it intuitively eating, but making sure each individual meal had this two to one or three to one uh, macro ratio of protein to fat. And I was not only able to get into ketosis, I stayed into ketosis the entire time. And I felt better, personally felt better with a higher protein, moderated fat, zero carb approach. And so what I initially got me interested in this was actually some of Dr. Ben Bickman's work and Dr. Ted Naiman, and they were talking about some of this research. And the thing that fascinated me the most is when Dr. Ben Bickman was speaking at, I think, Low Carb Vale or Breckenridge, and he presented these dog studies where he showed that you know, everyone has this big fear of gluconeogenesis and really it's a vital process that we should be thankful is happening in the body and not something to fear. And that everyone is afraid of it spiking insulin, but it spikes insulin on a high carb diet traditionally. And if someone is doing a high carb, low fat, you know, mostly low protein diet, it does spike insulin. On a high protein diet, it doesn't really spike insulin. And that's what got me interested in kind of digging more into this. And what I found so fascinating was not only was I able to stay in ketosis, I couldn't get kicked out of it. I even spiked my protein up on a couple of days over 180 grams per day, which is a lot. I mean, I'm a really tall girl, but I don't have a ton of lean mass and I don't work out a lot. So that's a lot of protein for me and I still stayed in ketosis. So I found this mechanism in my biochemistry studies and I'm using it as a part of my research. And there's this one mechanism, it's kind of a fail safe that happens in the body and it only happens in this one particular case when you're eating a lot of protein and low to no carb. And what happens is the body releases some insulin in response to the heightened amino acids circulating in the blood. But as a fail safe mechanism, it also releases a little bit of glucagon. And it does that so that you don't experience a low blood sugar event. You don't experience hypoglycemia. And so it raises blood sugar a little bit. And then I think that is a big reason why people will increase their protein a little, and then they get this higher blood sugar, and then they freak out, and they're like, oh, it's raising my blood sugar, and gluconeogenesis is dangerous, and all this stuff, when really it's only happening because of this mechanism. And especially if you're doing, you know, high, high protein, no carb, 
it's there to protect you against having hypoglycemia where the body would only release insulin and then your blood sugar would drop because you're actually, there's no carb coming in with it. And then your blood sugar would drop because of that insulin being released, pushing the existing blood sugar into your cells. And then you would have this hypoglycemia. So it's, it's only in this one case, which is so fascinating that the body has this protective mechanism in place there. Yeah, it seems like with a lot of this stuff, like we have, we have a lot of, um, we've got a lot of science, I guess, when it comes to nutrition and you can, you can look at like how valuable some of it is versus useless. And the one thing I always see is like, you know, we will get these arguments more or less about, oh, this, this study's flawed or the science is horrible on nutrition. And some of it I think is more, the, the science isn't always bad. A lot of times it's probably quite good science. It's just done in a very one dimensional way where we're looking kind of at a standard American diet and we're testing these things within that context. And we just, until recently, we haven't really started doing a lot more with like a ketogenic diet or even, you know, the opposite of that spectrum, a, a super low fat diet. Um, so it's really, it's just kind of interesting to see kind of how these, these situations change as we manipulate things in, in the diet quite drastically. That's so true. We just haven't really studied low carb diets or zero carb diets, you know, barely at all. And it's always been sort of a part of the diet. So we really don't have a ton of research and science on it, which is what's so cool about yeah. trying this stuff out and finding these things or like trying stuff out like you did, you know, setting a new record. Congratulations on that. You know, being Thanks. a zero carb athlete, it's really exciting. And I know, Sean, you're setting, you know, PRs all the time too and, and winning competitions. And uh, I just had a um, cyclist on the podcast yesterday I don't know if you know Sean Sakonowski, and he's pretty much a carnivore cyclist, and just he's so passionate about this, and it's so cool to see, especially athletes talking about this stuff because, mm -hmm. you know, I don't think a lot of I don't know if it's because it's kind of a like a strategic tool for a lot of athletes or you know what it is why people don't talk about it that much, but it's really cool to see that someone experimenting like yourself and then setting a new record. Yeah, it's, you know, I think it's interesting when you get into the athletic world, um, especially when you get into some of the, you know, really high, high level stuff like Tour de France, but and, and, you know, cyclists do a very good job of kind of keeping stuff under the radar in terms of what they're doing. The triathlon community is kind of like that as well. It's like, oh, I found something that's useful. I don't want the guy who's a minute behind me, you know, four hours into a long ride to be able to maximize his potential or her potential as well. Um, but you know, for, for me and the ultra marathon running community, like we're such a niche sport still. And it's, you know, my, my background was in, was in education and stuff. So like when I kind of stepped away from that, and even when I was still doing that and running ultra marathons, you know, I always thought like my, I guess my, my passion or drive has always been to kind of like share stuff and like share the information. So when I try stuff, I try to be pretty transparent about it and and that's somewhat become part of kind of how I've grown in the sport, I guess, where, uh, you know, I think it, it, some people probably look at it as like, oh, well, Zach's trying to like upset a nutritional paradigm within the endurance world. And really it's like, no, I'm just trying to share an alternative way to do this because, um, you know, I don't think I'm like some, some weird freak of nature who this works for uh, and that no one else is going to be able to have it happen. I think there's probably at least a, a sizable group of folks who can benefit from it. So to, to hide that under a rock, I think would be, um, unfortunate. Uh, but yeah, it's, it gets interesting when you get into the, the pro sports stuff. And I'll add though, too, uh, when you were talking about like the increased protein and, and, uh, ketosis, uh, that is something that I'm really interested in because I was, I haven't done probably nearly as much tinkering around with it as you have, but I have looked at some of my like blood ketone markers when I've done a more restricted protein approach where I'm kind of trying to keep it within a more traditional ketogenic protocol and then also tested them with the, the same, the same kind of protocol from lifestyle, but with just a really relaxed protein approach. And yeah, I haven't seen like a situation of that protein causing my ketone blood ketones to drop drastically. Uh, I will see sometimes, like what you mentioned, where I'll have high blood sugar in the presence of high ketones. Usually that's only if I test like right after a workout. Uh, and I just see that as kind of a more of a norm within an endurance community as well, where your body's mobilizing all these energy sources to kind of use them 
and when you stop, it doesn't just downregulate immediately. It takes a while for that to kind of normalize more or less. Yeah, that's exactly what would happen after exercise. Like you're, you'd be mobilizing all that blood sugar. Yeah, let me just just make a couple of observations, some comments and stuff. Of the, as I've done quite a bit of reading on in and around a lot of this stuff. You know, one of the things you know, gluconeogenesis, as you pointed out, is you know an essential uh, process that we have, and it's 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 actually works very well to regulate blood sugar. You know, when you're making your own blood sugar, it tends to be very stable, and it tends to be you know tightly regulated based on demand. Uh, I think most people are starting to see that it's a demand-driven process. It's not substrate-driven. Uh, so you can eat a lot of protein and your blood sugar is still going to remain at a stable level typically. And any excess protein, you know, if, if you do have some, will be converted to urea and then excreted you know, in the urine typically. But one of the evolutionary adaptations, there's some studies going back talking about uh, the fact that uh, they think that this, this uh, capacity to raise our glucose uh, went back to some of the some of the you know, time during our evolutionary past when it was you know quite cold out and it was it was difficult to obtain much carbohydrate and so we depended more on a meat and fat based diet and therefore uh, being able to maintain higher levels of glucose was essential for growth uh, particularly among you know during pregnancy and and then during infancy and so this is something that uh, you know may have been a, just an evolutionary adaptation to ensure that we have you know, adequate fuel to, you know, provide the substrates of bodies needs. And, and you know, we're, we're gluconeogenesis works very well. It's very effective. I've seen a number of type one diabetics that do a, uh, you know, a diet devoid of carbohydrates and their blood glucose is not zero. I mean, it's, it's, it, you know, it's, it's very stable. It tends to be relatively low and very flat line. So they don't have a lot of significant swings, which, we do know that these high high peaks and valleys in blood glucose is probably a significant contributor to some of the pathophysiology that occurs around diabetes. And so maintaining a stable blood glucose uh, is probably one of the more important things that we see out there. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think what's what's interesting to me though is that the higher blood sugar that some people see, I really think it has more to do with the carb intake than eating a higher amount of protein, but that people will see that reflection when they're testing and then think that there's something negative happening when really it just has to do with this fail-safe mechanism that is in place in case you were eating only protein. It's, it's there you know, to protect you from this hypoglycemic event. And I find that so interesting. And I think that it's it's really cool for people to try experimenting with having more protein and seeing, you know, even just in incremental amounts, if they can stay in ketosis and maybe, you know, trying less carb, maybe sometimes that it's the higher amount of carb that is influencing that blood sugar number to be higher or kicking someone out of ketosis. And maybe it's not necessarily the protein because protein is as you all know, functional material in the body. It's not seen as a source of fuel in the body. You know, our total energy pool is 77% of our body's total energy pool is fatty acids. And then, you know, we have stored glycogen and protein is really there to play a part of, as a biochemical. It has a, such an important role in the body as functional material. So it's really not perceived by the body as a fuel. And I think that it, it could be interesting for people to try more protein and see, you know, if they can stay in ketosis, you know, or to see how they feel because maybe you're not producing as many ketones because you're using them more efficiently, but you have more energy or you feel better. So uh, this is the thing that I love the most that's come out about this carnivore trend that, you know, is a lifestyle for people like yourselves and, I think the coolest thing is just seeing that people are trying more protein and not fearing eating higher amounts of protein. Like we shouldn't be fearing going from fearing fat to fearing protein, which seems kind of crazy. Yeah. I was going to ask about that uh, from, from your background or research and Sean, you can probably add to this as well is the kind of fear of gluconeogenesis. Is that something that has been, popularized by the ketogenic movement then or was there always been a has that always been kind of something that in nutrition we were trying to avoid even before kind of 
the high fat or ketogenic got kind of repopularized in the last decade or so? I mean, if I were to answer that, I would say I have only come across it really in ketogenic, in the kind of keto circles is people fearing it and seeing that keto is only and can only be achieved with an intake of, you know, over 70% fat and really keeping the, pro the protein very, very moderated to restricted. Um, but what's really interesting to me is that when you control the starches and you keep them as low as possible and you have an adequate, maybe prioritized protein a little bit more, that you don't have to be eating all this fat all the time either because you are fat adapted, your body is going to be able to take that 70, 80% of intake from your body stored fat as well. And it doesn't, you don't have to be eating all this fat. Um, everyone has tons of stored fat on their body, even in a lean person. And like I was saying, it's 77% of the total energy pool. So, you know, I think that's, to me, I've only really seen this fear of overeating protein or gluconeogenesis in sort of this ketogenic world, because the goal is ketosis. And that's why I want to study ketosis as a metabolic state in the body that can be achieved. It can be achieved with a traditional ketogenic diet. It can be achieved through fasting protocols, and it can also be achieved with a higher protein, moderated fat, zero carb approach. And that's what I'm really interested in, you know, studying and looking at it as a metabolic state and not just as this one diet that has these specific macros. Vanessa, let me just, uh, just ask you why you feel that ketosis is a ideal or a better, or some people might say a natural state for human beings. I mean, there's a lot of controversy around that. There's a lot of, a lot of crit critics out there that will say that, you know, ketosis, constant ketosis over the long haul can be deleterious. What are your thoughts on, on those sort of uh, comments? So I like, I think that's a great question. I think the reason that I really like being in a state of ketosis is because I'm in a fat fueled state and we all have the ability to either be sugar burners or fat burners. And I much prefer to tap into the metabolic ability that I have to burn fat because it's a sustained energy. I don't have these up and down, you know, crashes or dependence on eating carbs all the time. I get a lot of mental clarity, mental benefits from the production of ketones. Ketones themselves, we're now seeing in the latest research and studies, actually have a positive feedback loop in the body. And they actually, the presence of ketones actually promotes mitochondrial biogenesis in the body and other cells and tissues. There's so many amazing benefits. It's also GABA dominant, so we can get into a more relaxed, calm, peaceful state. I mean, there's so many benefits to being in a state of ketosis. I don't think that that means you have to exist in it every second of the day, but to me, it just means that if you are tapping into your body's ability to make ketones, it's because you're also burning body fat, you're also burning stored uh, dietary fat, and you're not just burning sugar that you're taking in. So you become a lot less dependent on having to eat frequently throughout the day. You can tap into, you know, your body's ability to have this metabol metabolic flexibility between burning glucose, between burning fat. And so to me, there's just all these benefits to it. Uh, I don't think that means that it's for everyone in the world, but for me personally, I've pretty much been in ketosis for the last four years. And I have found that my life has improved in so many different ways in terms of my energy, my mental abilities, especially. And, you know, my grandfather died of type two di diabetes and we have a lot of metabolic syndrome in the family. My brother has epilepsy. I have this predisposition towards it. And my insulin sensitivity is so incredibly high and my fasting insulin is very low. And all of this has come from implementing these strategies that all kind of go hand in hand with being in a state of ketosis. So I'm a big fan, fan of it, if you can't tell. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, there are a lot of people that, that do seem to, to, to state that they feel better that way. Um, one thing that, um, and this is something out there that I think has gotten a lot of uh, questioning recently as they talk about, you know, does a certain level of ketone, a higher level of ketone, 
necessarily equate to your burning fat because there are people that will gain body fat even while they're in ketosis on a ketogenic diet. You know, this is, these are people that, you know, may, may do that through eat, consuming excess dietary fat. You know, people that are, you know, eating copious amounts of cream and butter and, and just adding more and more stuff. Uh, there's also some uh, evidence that people, particularly like athletes that become very well adapted to that will produce a relatively small amount of ketones. You know, it'll show up maybe, you know, if you, we want to talk about, you know, numbers, you know, where 0.5 uh, is often considered the, the threshold. That's been questioned as maybe lower, even Bullock and Finney have questioned that it might be even lower. And so we're seeing people that uh, routinely run kind of low levels of ketones, which you could argue maybe they're still in, you know, they're, they're still arguably in ketosis. And it's not necessarily you need to have these really high levels to be burning fat. And so I think that's something that is, you know, like anything we learn more and more as time goes on. Have you got any insight into that sort of stuff? Yeah, absolutely. So this is one of the coolest areas of research, I think, is there's so many things about ketones that we're going to be learning about. As soon as you have ketones present in your blood, it means that you're burning fat for fuel on your body because ketones are a byproduct of fatty acid degradation in the body and fat, fatty acid mobilization on the body. So if someone is not taking any, any exogenous ketones and they're seeing any level of beta, hydro, beta hydroxybutyrate in the blood, then they are technically in ketosis. But some people will have higher levels and some people will have lower levels. And a lot of that, in my opinion, has to do with the efficient use. So some people are producing, are overproducing ketones and some people are producing a very small amount, but they're very active. So they're using them extremely efficiently. Ketones themselves actually have a caloric value, which a lot of people don't realize. So if someone is like eating a really high fat diet, I'm a proponent of that if it means that the carbs and starches are extremely well controlled. But if someone's eating tons and tons of fat and they're also ingesting exogenous ketones and then they're seeing high ketones and they're, they may also be gaining weight, it's just an excess of energy at that point because ketones themselves have a caloric value. So if you're drinking ketones, like you're seeing a six to seven cal caloric value for ketone with all this other fat that you're also taking in and you're not burning that off, then the body is going to go into storage accumulation in a storage mode as opposed to storage burning and mobilization mode. So to me, if you're seeing any amount of ketones, any measurable amount of ketones in your blood, you are technically in ketosis. I think I also really like to look at blood sugar numbers as well, but as soon as you have any appreciable amount, then you technically are creating ketones. If you're not taking any in, if you're not drinking them or eating them, uh, and that's really the caveat there. Yeah, one of the uh, things that people will observe is that, you know, as you are liberating, you know, beta hydroxybutyrate and then you're wasting, you know, acetoacetate and acetone, you know, through ketone production, uh, you know, you're, you're tapping into beta hydroxybutyrate Beta, hydro, beta oxidation to utilize the fats, but at the same time, your dietary uh, source is lots of fats and you're also storing fats. And so it's kind of a, you know, kind of a, you know, net negative in many cases. And so that's where maybe perhaps the, the state of ketosis obtained through either caloric restriction or perhaps, you know, a more protein based macronutrient uh, style. Uh, might be of further benefit so that you you, 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 you you utilize more than you store. Whereas you're, you know, eating lots of fat to maintain that, that may be a, a, a sort of a strategy that doesn't hold up that well for everyone. Well, I think it also, it's like, it's like you touched on earlier. It's like we've got this massive reserve on board of fat. So even when we look at like ratios of carbs to fats to proteins, I think a lot of times people forget about that onboard storage and they're looking at, okay, this is what I ate today. Therefore that's my ratio. And in reality, it's like, um, I always think about this because my, my days fluctuate so much and what my activity level might be like. So if, if I do a huge workout, you know, I might be in a, a fairly sizable calorie deficit that day. Uh, you know, if I have a big enough workout the next day, I'm probably going easier and being in a calorie surplus. So it all kind of balances out over time. Um, but that makes it kind of an interesting scenario where 
it's like if I look at what I ate, my ratios of fats to carbs to proteins might be quite different than what the ratios are from a metabolic standpoint. Yeah, I think that's the, that's the, the main point there is really, um, you know, we have so much fat storage on our body that you can be in a state of ketosis, even if you're not eating any fat, <laughs> if you're just eating protein, you could get into it with almost no dietary fat if you have stored body fat to tap into. And uh, again, with Sean, I think it, it goes back to your goals and, and what you're optimizing for. And if you're optimizing for body composition and having a low fat percentage, then consuming a lot of fat is probably um, not ideal strategically. Consuming more protein and lower carb and moderating fat is probably going to get to your goals uh, get you to your goals quicker. Yeah, I mean, we certainly see that, you know, and, and I always sort of look at guys that, that compete in bodybuilding, I mean, or, or fitness professionals. I mean, these people know how to get lean. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I mean, if you want to look at the leanest people on earth and see what they do, and, and generally what they do is they eat a fairly high protein diet uh, and they restrict, you know, other sources of calories, whether it's protein or fats. And then often they go on low fat diets and relatively low carbohydrate that's how they get leaner and so the question then becomes you know what is sustainable long term for people because anybody that does that you know it's not a particularly uh you know getting down to really low levels of body fat we're talking you know for girls you know 14 13 12 10 percent guys you know four three four five percent that's just not sustainable and it's it's not a good position but from a human, just a day-to-day, -day, you know, say you're at a, a, a you know, non-competitive body composition, you know, say normal, healthy human being, which I would argue is several percentage body fats higher than what we see in these competition people. What do you feel is a, a decent ratio of fat to protein? I know a lot of people ask me about that all the time. I know we had folks like Mickey Bandora on who says that, you know, maybe humans obtain, you know, 30, 40% of their diet from, from protein and the rest from fat sourced, uh, which is, you know, 60% fat, which would be by, you know, uh, we're talking calorically, you know, which is obviously different on a gram to gram ratio. And that is something that, you know, may, may be more in line with what many humans evolve around. What are your thoughts on kind of a maintenance level of, of, uh, of, of fat to protein and, and then carbohydrate if, if needed? Yeah, I mean, my main thought on that is I really think each person has to find that for themselves. And that's why I encourage so much experimentation. And I love biohacking is like I found what happens to be the best diet for me. Sometimes my typical intake now is much closer to around 50 to 60% protein. And the rest is coming from dietary fat and really little from carb. I mean, zero to five percent sometimes trace carbs and just the lowest starch highest micronutrient vegetables if i do take those in and that's what i found is working really well for me and optimizing for the mental clarity i get from i like i said i like being in ketosis and staying in ketosis so i'm able to do that at those ratios and also i'm optimizing right now for building more lean mass and I want to have really strong muscles. I want to have high bone density. And I'm seeing that from eating higher levels of protein and moderating my fat down somewhat. So I really encourage every person to find out what that sweet spot is for themselves because it depends on what you're optimizing for. And some people are optimizing for like long, just longevity. Some people are optimizing just for energy for some people have therapeutic, you know, maybe they have epilepsy. So they need to be in a state of a high state of ketosis all the time. So, but I think your, your question was more for the average person. I think we just vary so much individually in terms of what we're looking for. I just think that it's really interesting to experiment with eating more protein. And if you want to be in ketosis, lowering the starch more, increasing the protein and moderating the fat. And I found that I've been able to stay in ketosis really easily that way. And that's what I'm doing my research on right now, you know, is there's different routes to being in that state of ketosis if that's something that's your goal and that's something that you like doing. And, you know, it doesn't have to be just this one way. Um, I'm curious, though, if you ever test your ketones and blood sugar. 
Is that is that towards me or towards Zach? I mean, I can tell you, I've never checked my ketones ever one time. <laughs> I have checked my blood sugar, you know, and, and it was kind of interesting. It was relatively high, uh, but it was found, but it never went really high. I mean, it, it's it's very stable, and I haven't checked it in in probably I don't know eight or nine months. I just I just don't have much a great deal of interest in, in that particular metric right now, as far as, uh, you know, what my, what my goals are. And, and so when you say you like to, um, you know, test things or, you know, what works right for you, how are you deciding that? Because, you know, uh, is it blood ketones? Is it blood glucose? Is there something else that you find that is more, uh, appropriate as to, to, to determining how you're reaching your goals? Well, I think one of the most important things that we don't really look at or talk about is just happiness and feeling good in your body. And isn't that what all of this is for is like just to feel good, feel happy so that you can live all your dreams out. You can have the confidence to live all your dreams, pursue your dreams, have the energy to, you know, do everything you want to do, be with your family, be with your loved ones. Like, for me, that's the most important factor. I like to use all these tools because I'm a huge data nerd and geek. And so I like to see certain things and I like to correlate them. So I always tell people, keep a journal if you're testing. And like when you feel awesome, you feel full of energy, you feel happy, you feel, you know, really like independent from thinking about food or preoccupation with food, you feel all these great things, take measurements and see what those are. And you can draw correlations for yourself based on what that means if you are interested in tracking your data. Uh, for me, I like to see good blood work and you know, having diabetes in my family, you know, I have a fasting insulin now of 2.1 and like it was so low that my doctor <laughs> like circled it. It was like, this is below you know, the norm. And I, I guess I kind of like that um, for myself personally. I just really like the idea of being really insulin sensitive, but it, to me, it all comes back down to having a really high quality of life. And so I use this data as a way to draw these correlations. And, you know, if my blood sugar is going up and down all the time, so is my mood. Like I used to have really volatile moods and since going keto and doing all this, I have very consistent, stable moods and I honestly don't know how I really operated in life before when I was on those up and downs all the time of like these, you know, highs and crashes and, you know, thinking about dinner while I was eating lunch and all this stuff. And now my mood is like my blood sugar. And I really think that there's a strong correlation between those two. And I've done different tests with a, a continuous blood glucose monitor and my blood glucose doesn't move, you know, it's, it's straight all the time. And I love that my mood doesn't either. My mood is very calm, very stable. I know some of that is from the GABA effects as well, being GABA dominant on keto and all these anti-excitatory effects that being in ketosis uh, has. I'm able to keep up with all these things. And I think that that is partly due to having really high mental clarity, mental sharpness, and really stable mood and blood sugar and all these things kind of coming together. So, you know, everyone has to know for themselves, what do they want to most experience? If maybe your goal is to win a world record or set a new world record in athletic competition or performance, um, you know, to me, just being a really happy, high functioning individual is being a human performance outlier, you know, being able to, to produce on a really high level is being an outlier too. And um, yeah, I think it's, it's different for everyone. Yeah, I mean, you may have seen a recent study that looked at uh, metabolic health among Americans, and they uh, sadly saw that something like 88% of all Americans do not have optimal metabolic health. You know, when they looked at things like waist uh, to height circumference, insulin, uh, glucose levels, uh, you know, blood pressure, you know, there's a whole bunch of metrics, and only 12% of the U.S. population could hit those things, which I think is, is goes to your point of saying, you know, if you're healthy, you're an outlier, which is a very sad state to be in. You know, we, we normal is, you know, the, the new normal is tragically sick. And I think <laughs> we have to do something to, uh, you know, to turn that around. It's just not a good situation to be in. You know, like I put up a post on Instagram saying, as a country, we're batting 120. And if you're a baseball player, you, you lose your job. 
And so I think we have to sort of say, where did we go wrong and how do we fix it? Because it is, it is tragic. But yeah, that's, you know, that's, that's a point I often talk about. And guys like Rob Wolf talk about this. You know, it's important how you feel, how you function, you know, what your body composition is. Those things are incredibly important. And that, and that ultimately is what we're after. We're not after, you know, blood ketone level of 1.7. That's not our goal. Our goal is to, you know, live life and enjoy life and feel good. And I think that's, that's a message that more and more people need to keep, keep that in mind when we're, when, we're, when we're looking at ultimately what we're trying to do. Yeah, no, I think I, I agree so much with the using mood as kind of a metric, your own metric, your own personal metric to find out if what you're doing is, is, is good. And there's other variables too, like, you know, like sleep and, you know, good social relationships and things like that, that are going to affect that. But if those are other things that I think you can kind of be honest with yourself and know like, Oh, did I get enough sleep? Yes or no. Or do I have good meaningful relationships? Yes or no. Nutrition seems to be the one where like, you know, it's who do you listen to? There's such a variety of different options out there. And some of them are like contradictory to the others. So, you know, I'll use that one all the time. To be honest with myself, it's like if my mood is good. Um, chances are I'm getting what I need nutritionally when those other things are in check. And I'll also use it too sometimes like I'll have people reach out to me on emails and social media and things like that. And 99% of the time, it's, you know, super positive stuff. But every once in a while, you'll have someone come in with all kinds of fiery aggression right out the gate without ever having a dialogue. And it's like, to me, if they're coming at me from a nutritional angle with that type of aggression, my first thought is, why would I do your nutritional approach if your first response to me is just coming at me, and, you know, basically name calling? And um, like I said, I get very little of that, but it is, it does pop up in my head when they, those do roll through every once in a while. It's like, okay, so you want me to do, you want me to overhaul my nutrition based on, on your attitude. <laughs> so, I mean, Sean, you probably see more of that than I do, but. <laughs> yeah, there's, yeah, there's no shortage of, of anger filled <laughs> vegans that don't like me. And so, yeah, you, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, Vanessa, I, I want to, first, I want to laud you for the fact that you're prioritizing uh, putting on muscle because, you know, as a, as a, you know, particularly as a relatively thin Caucasian female, you're at extremely high risk for osteoporosis as you get older and many women, I mean, and I saw it all the time. I, I can't tell you how many little old ladies with broken hips I ended up having to fix over the years. And it's very sad to see. It's very debilitating, but it's not just breaking your hip at 80. I mean, it's, there's, there's a lot of things that go into functional decline that start in the thirties and forties and fifties where you just become, you know, less and less functional. And I think that's a very sad thing. And so let me hear about what your strategy is, you know, for a lot of the, you know, maybe the females out there that are listening for you to put on muscle, because I think it's incredibly, probably as much or more so important for females to, to engage in, uh, you know, at least to, to endeavor to put on muscle and, and, and gain strength rather than to be the sort of the frail, you know, super thin uh, folks that often people strive to be. Yeah, I love that point and that, that question. And I think it's so important for women to focus not only on gaining muscle, but also bone density. And you can't build stronger bones without having a, a really good protein intake. And one of the things I love about keto is that, you know, you look at the standard food pyramid. And to me, I call it the biggest you know, pyramid scheme of all because it's upside down. You know, it really needs to be flipped on its head and we need to base our plates firstly around prioritizing protein and then that's the essentials, essential amino acids that our body cannot synthesize on its own and then adding in those essential fatty acids as well, but also consuming red meat for iron. I think there's so many people out there who don't even exercise because they're anemic. And the more I study biochemistry, I see the importance of iron and hemoglobin and carnitine is so important. If you want to burn fat, you need to have carnitine. It's part of the trend, you know, transferase that happens when you burn fatty acids. So all of these things are so important, but you can't build muscle. You can't build denser bones without having a higher protein intake. So one thing, the first thing that I'm doing is implementing and been implementing this higher protein intake, which I've modified. I've, I've been running a you know, keto program for several years, and I just added in this new higher protein approach to it as well. So getting the food right, prioritizing protein and fat, 
And now what I've started doing, I'm a huge fan of the lean, I believe it's called, um, is it lean games method? Um, is it Max Lugavere? I think his name is, I may not be saying it right, but he has an approach which is doing short intensive bursts of exercise to failure. And I really think it's a great approach for women, especially men too, but women who are really busy and have busy schedules with kids. And they're like, for years I talked about doing keto for body composition for fat loss without exercise. I said this for years. You can lose weight and burn fat without exercise. And the reason that I push that message a lot is because there are so many people out there who give up on their health because they can't exercise, they don't have the energy to exercise in the first place. Maybe they're anemic, maybe they're just too overweight and they have too much pain in their body or they have an autoimmune condition. And so exercise is just beyond you know, their abilities and then they just go, well, I'm just gonna be unhealthy and live this way because I have no other choice. So for years I pushed this message like, do keto, get your food right, eat you know, real food and you, will, you can burn fat and lose weight without exercise if you can't do it. But that never meant that I was anti-exercise or anti-movement. I think movement is so important and they really, the two go together. And I just think that the other point of it is that so many women and men are so busy these days that it's really hard to say like, I'm gonna join CrossFit or go to the gym you know, four to five days a week and be there for an hour. Well, you really don't have to be there for an hour, four days a week. And I really like, you know, the, the lean gains method. I've been studying it and reading up about it. And I'm also studying physiology, you know, in my science courses as well and learning how these short intensive bursts of weight bearing exercise that you can do even just with your own body weight at home and do it to failure. So I'll do squats to failure. I'll do, you know, these <laughs> itty bitty push-ups. I do them until I can't do it anymore and then I'll hold. And, you know, I do some of these various body weight exercises at home in addition to yoga that I like to do just for stretching and, and flexibility. And, you know, I am seeing differences in that. I'm seeing like when I started doing it, I could barely do some of these things and barely get myself up from doing some squats. And now I'm like, like, it's almost like I have springs in my legs, you know, from developing this. And it's, it's really, really cool. And I'm really excited to do uh, some new body composition scans and see, you know, how much lean mass I've built. I, I want to gain right now about six more pounds of lean muscle mass. And so I think that there's a lot of strategies and ways that you can combine that proper diet with doing minimal, like I'm a minimalist, so minimal amount of exercise that will get you the most results. And you probably know a lot more about that than I do. Uh, my specialty has really just been more on the you know, nutrition side and diet side. Yeah. You know, I think uh, it's, it, it's great to hear that because I think within like fitness and exercise, we have this really goofy situation going on where for whatever reason for the for the longest time it's like when you think of men and you think of exercise there the the message has always been go to the gym and get bigger get bigger muscles get stronger and for the women it's just been the opposite of that it's like go catabolic get on the elliptical get on the treadmill you know do these one two hour cycling sessions and things like that and it's it it's uh you know it's cool to see that uh, someone like yourself who has a big audience is kind of changing that direction. And, and I think the industry is also changing quite a bit in the last few years as well. But um, it's always good to kind of see that direction too. And it's one thing I always have a conversation with when someone reaches out to me uh, for either coaching or just consults and things with fitness. You, usually they're coming to me for running. Um, you know, no one's coming to me to try to put on 50 pounds of muscle. <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, I'll ask them that because I want to know, like, what is, your, what is your goal and what are you trying to get from me? Because like if their goal is to just be healthy or um, to be stronger or something like that, I'm probably not going to put them through an ultra marathon running training program. In fact, I'm going to advise them not to do that unless for whatever reason, that's a really passionate thing for them to go out and run in the mountains or something like that. Yeah, let me just a couple points on there, Vanessa. I think, you know, one thing, you know, 
lean muscle mass is both metabolic and functional currency, you know, and, and, and you know, you absolutely need to maintain that to, to maintain a good quality of life and it protects you from disease. There's numerous, numerous studies out there that support that maintaining lean muscle mass will protect you from metabolic disease, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cognitive decline, uh, even, even some evidence that might protect you from cancer. And so I think these things are uh, paramount for all of us to engage in. Now, as far as uh, your comments about, you know, diet and exercise and some people not being exercised. I'm a, I am a tremendous, and Zach is too, we're both tremendous advocates of exercise, and, it, can, and it, it is a very, very important and vital tool. But having said that, I agree with you completely. There are many people that are in a position where, you know, their body is not set up at that time to exercise. And I've seen that time and time again. I used to see it as a surgeon. You know, the new year would come around and we're getting close to, you know, it's almost the start of another year and people will adopt a aggressive exercise routine. And a lot of times they'll come back and they'll get injured and we'll see it because their, their body tissues are not necessarily, uh, well, uh, they're, they're in a bad situation with, with their body composition, their body tissue and their strength weight ratios. And so they end up with a knee injury or shoulder injury or back injury. And, and then they just give up because they're in so much pain. And so I do think, uh, starting with diet and fixing that. And then, you know, not only does it often, if, if you're in the right diet, it makes you feel good to where you want to exercise. It makes, and I think it can help with the actual body composition and the quality of your body tissue and, and make you injury resistant. And so I think uh, it, is, it is a very important concept to realize that not everyone can start off, uh, you know, doing a bunch of burpees and CrossFit workouts on day one. You have to, uh, you know, put yourself in a position to be there. And I think that's, uh, uh, I know that uh, there are other people who think, well, everybody's just too damn lazy and they need to, you know, get off their ass and work hard. I mean, I, I think that has a role, and but it may not be the first thing people are able to do. And I think uh, once you get to where you enjoy exercise, uh, you know, then you can do that. And then the other point is, you know, and, and you talk about a lean gaze method, but there are, the bottom line is there are a lot of ways to put on muscle. There's a lot of different exercise protocols out there and the one that's going to work. And the same thing with the diets, the diets that you can, that you can stick to. It's the exercise protocol that you can stick to. One of the things I like to promote are finding exercises that you can do uh, that you're not going to get hurt because I think there's some exercises that lend themselves uh, more, more easily to injury than others. And so I think you have to, particularly if you're not, very experienced, you need to figure out which ones are going to less likely to cause an injury. Yeah, I think that's why I like body weight exercises so much. And it's something that you can do easily from home. If you just have a yoga mat and YouTube, you know, you can go on and find easy body weight exercises. And, you know, a lot of the gyms and all the weights and, and stuff in there kind of intimidate me. And I, I wouldn't want to go in there and be doing exercise in a, like with bad form. Um, you know, I would want to do it only with proper form. So if you were to go in there and just pick up weights and be doing stuff, you could be doing more harm than good. Uh, so that's why I like the, you know, really simple at home body, body weight exercises. It's very weight bearing. You can do a lot. You don't have to spend the time also, you know, or money getting a gym membership or going to the gym. So it's a kind of an easy way for people to just get started and doing stuff at home. And I do little things like a year ago, I decided I'm always going to take the stairs instead of taking the escalator. And I do that everywhere. Like I was in Las Vegas in September and my best friend was with me and I'm like, we're taking the stairs and you know, it's like over a hundred degrees and you're in Las Vegas and everyone's on the escalator and we're the only people taking the stairs, but it impacts like every little bit impacts. We only live on the second floor here, but I take the stairs every time. And a lot of times I did take the elevator sometimes like, and it's just those little things adding up and having shifting your mindset to like, I'm just going to do these little things here and there. And it's, it really adds up. Now for a word from our sponsors. Hey folks, thank you for tuning in to the Human Performance Outliers podcast. Uh, we are very excited to have ButcherBox sponsoring the show. Sean, why don't you tell us about some of your experiences? Yeah, I mean, I've been, you know, basically mostly just going with their custom boxes. I've been going with uh, ribeyes and uh, New York strip steaks. They're all 
uh, grass finished, antibiotic free, hormone free. They're actually pretty decently marbled for a grass finished product. I've been enjoying it lately. I've been throwing it on the on the uh, in the sous vide and then uh, reverse searing or then searing it up in a cast iron pan. That's been pretty darn tasty. I've enjoyed it. Uh, the consistency I found on pretty much every single steak has been very high, very good and very high. Uh, flavor's been good, and I really enjoyed it. I think uh, you know looking around at some of the other competitors and some of the other grass finished products that you might get in the store this is actually a fair bit more economical and so i think it's a, it's a good value good quality and in and, and a very uh you know enjoyable flavorful uh way to get your steaks awesome thanks sean remember to get your discount and free bacon type in promo code hpo at the checkout now back to the show Yeah, I mean, I think that's 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 not a bad strategy. Taking the stairs, you know, when I when I was in the hospital, all the physicians were taking the stairs, all the patients were taking the elevator, and it was kind of funny to uh, to see the difference in that sort of thing. Um, tell me about the the situation in in the Czech Republic. Is there is there a keto community there? Is it well accepted there? What is what is society like in in you know in that part of the world? How does it receive? It's very interesting here. Czech is known actually as one of the fattest countries in Europe. Uh, it, they compete annually for beer consumption with Ireland. <laughs> um, and they love their beer. They love their bread and dumplings and carbs. And so it's a very different mindset from keto and sugar and like pastries and all that. It's very much a part of the lifestyle. And when I first started coming here, I actually like, I'll go in the bookstore. I went in the bookstore last week and I just kind of survey what's there. Cause you can tell by what they put on the display, you know, my book and so many keto books are like you walk into bookstores and they're right there in North America. You can find them at, you know, Costco everywhere. Um, and so it's a good barometer of seeing like where people's consciousness is at and they don't have anything like that. I mean, if, if anything, the health books that they're showing are more vegetarian, like plant-based, this and that. Um, it's very, very new here in the last several months, there's been some kind of sort of pickup of keto on people's radar. Um, I had a hotel contact me cause they wanted to add a keto uh, recipe or meal to their um, restaurant menu. Uh, there's been more interest. I've had more like people buying my program and stuff from Czech. Like there's a small amount, but it's very small. There's no kind of like community here. If anything, they have a little. They have a consciousness of gluten free and sugar free and paleo. So it's kind of like where we were at more like five years ago in North America. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, it's, it's interesting because as soon as you go to Sweden or the UK, there's so much consciousness and, and awareness of this stuff. But for some reason, uh, sort of in central Europe, it's not as well known. Um, but I do think it's coming and people are starting to talk about it more and become more aware of their health, but it's still very, very <laughs> early here. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's cultural. It's very culturally ingrained to sort of eat a certain way in this kind of lifestyle. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure. I actually was in Austin in June for KetoCon. And, uh, you know, it's a very fit city. And I was at the Whole Foods there. And my mouth, like, I, my mouth was just dropped open seeing all these, like, really tan, fit people because like I've been over here for a while and you just don't really see that. Like, I'm not saying that people are drastically unhealthy here. You don't really see the extremes in Europe as much. Like in the U S you see more extremes of obesity and extremes of like hyper fit people. Um, and here you just don't really see that so much. It's more just everyone's kind of, um, yeah, less extreme, more, moderated if that makes sense i think when you get into countries that have quite a bit of wealth like the united states says it allows for these extremes and unfortunately we do have too much excess of, of the obesity stream and probably not enough of the people that take care of themselves 
Let me ask you another, just a personal personal question uh, from for my personal benefit. What's the uh, what's the meat like? What's the meat situation like in the Czech Republic? Can you get some good oh, stuff there? It is like it's a carnivore paradise here, and you know we had so we just had the Christmas markets open here this week, and you can't walk through Prague without seeing three or four like entire pigs like roasting on a spit like it's <laughs> it's just huge here um and they love 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 meat so it's it's very easy to do any kind of keto carnivore any kind of diet like that here because you just say like don't bring the bread or potatoes or dumplings um but they love pork here pork is huge um and they love they love to eat meat it's it's I mean, it, Prague is kind of, you've been here, so you know it's like this medieval time capsule. But, I mean, how many times would you be walking through a city in the U.S. and see like a pork, like a pig roasting? <laughs> Honestly, it's just like part of the city here because you've got all this medieval architecture and it's kind of like part of that, you know, um, part of the culture. But the the food here is really, really good. It actually... I was vegetarian for over 17 years and I stopped being a vegetarian about the summer that we came over here because I knew from being in Europe before that I had already been going a bit in that direction, but I knew from being here before that meat is very easy to eat here and it's kind of harder to do a plant-based like a vegetarian lifestyle that I was doing before. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's abundant and, it makes this whole lifestyle really easy. Like I can even get, because they have more sort of like little butcher shop culture than like these big mega supermarkets and things. Like they don't have Costco or those kinds of things. So we have a little butcher that we go to and they make like all these salami and cured meats and stuff with nothing but just the meat and salt. There's no preservatives, there's no sugar, dextrose like added. So. A lot of times people look at my place and they're like, you know, how can you eat all this like processed meat and stuff? I'm like, I, I'm lucky, like I live here and we have access to this kind of stuff. So uh, it's a really big perk of living over here. Do you, do you speak the language? Can you speak Czech or, or what is, uh, where are you at with that? No, I started studying in a bit when I got here. So I was conversant, but um, most people speak English and it's not a language that's spoken much outside of Czech. So I didn't feel the need to, you know, I, I love languages. I speak four other languages, uh, including Mandarin. So I absolutely love linguistics and studying languages, but I just didn't really see a huge need to, to learn Czech fully. Uh, it's a very complicated language, but as long as you're conversant, I find that people just, as long as you're respectful and you kind of approach people in Czech and you don't just go up to them and start speaking English, like assuming that everyone should know and speak English, it, that little bit of respect makes all the difference. Yeah, I think that's, a, that's the same case everywhere. I know because I can speak enough French to get by. My girlfriend's from France and so, when we go there, I, I, I'm always mindful of that, and I find it, you know, when you make an attempt and they realize that you're butchering their language, they say, okay, I'll speak your English, but, but it's kind of funny. So well, tell us, what's, 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 what's coming up for you on, in 2019? What can we look forward to? Where does everybody find you? You know, that type of stuff, uh, uh, just to let us know what, to, what, what we can expect from ketogenic girl. We're going to be protogenic girl. Maybe you'll be protogenic girl. <laughs> protogenic girl, yes, I, I carnivorous girl. Um, all these different things. I, my biggest thing really right now is my studies and, you know, going back to school has been very challenging, but it's been incredible learning really biochemistry of how all of this works. And I want to pursue more of that and continue and, and pursue a postgraduate degree in science. And I just think that studying this stuff is just going to help me able to communicate all this information better because my vision really is for us to have a world without modern disease, chronic, modern, non-infectious disease, which 
so much of it can be prevented and treated with real whole foods nutrition. So it's really part of my overall vision and I love studying this stuff. I love studying physiology, anatomy, biochemistry, and you know, helping people make the connections between you know, what they're eating, how they're living, and how it's connecting to their future health and preventing disease. And I, I really think that's, that's huge. So I'm gonna continue to be studying and continue with the podcast with Fast Keto. Uh, it's the most fun I have every week is just getting to do the podcast and interview people and pick their brains and people like yourselves and you know, Ben Bickman and, and having these guests on that I get to just ask them all these questions um, and, and learn with, with having these guests on. And I'm gonna be writing a second book, a sequel to Keto Essentials with all this knowledge and um, all this new knowledge and writing my research project on keto as a metabolic state that can be achieved with high protein, zero carb, with all these different strategies. Awesome. Yeah. And if there's any of those links that you want us to post on the show notes, definitely send them over and we'll, we'll direct our listeners over, over to that stuff. But it sounds like you've got an exciting year coming up and uh, I'm sure we'll keep seeing great things coming from you. Thanks so much. Yeah, Vanessa, thanks for coming on, especially on, on short notice. I know we, we talked about you coming on and we said, hey, can you come on tomorrow? And you said, yeah, sure, I'll come on. <laughs> we really appreciate that. Well, enjoy uh, Christmas in, in, you know, well, I guess maybe in Denver, if that's where you're going to be. And then, uh, we look forward to, you know, seeing how you progress and, and seeing what you learn. And so maybe maybe uh, down the road, we'll get you back on here and see what things have, uh, you know, let's see how things have evolved for you. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me on, guys. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, take care. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with hosts Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. If you enjoyed the show, please consider following us on social media and checking out our websites. Links to those can be found in the show notes. Also, if you have any questions or comments, please do not hesitate to shoot us an email at hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for tuning into the show.